In this video, we are going to discuss the mathematical description of a wave. Now we're going to use what we refer to as a wave function that's used to describe the motion of a particle within the medium. So it's used to find the position of a particle in the medium at a specific time. Because remember, even though the wave is traveling forward, the actual particles that make up the medium are oscillating back and forth. So wherever they're at, they're actually staying in place in for a transverse wave in the x direction, and they're only oscillating up and down in the y direction. So the wave function is going to be a function of position for in the x direction and time t. And that's going to tell you, okay, your x position tells you what particle you're talking about, and time t tells you where in the oscillation you're actually at. So because these are particles oscillating up and down, we are going to have our wave function, and we're going to use a sinusoidal wave just like we did in the previous unit to describe a simple harmonic oscillator. There are other ways of describing repetitive motion, but sinusoidal waves are the easiest one in order to use. So we're just going to keep using what's easy because our purpose here is to understand how it works, not necessarily to describe something really fancy. So we're really starting from the same place we would have started at when we talked about simple harmonic oscillators. So we have an amplitude, which is your max distance from the equilibrium, and then there's a frequency, and then time is identified here. All right, so this needs to be a function of both position and time. So we have to get position in there some other other. And we're going to do that um, by essentially rewriting t here. Because remember, velocity equals position over time, so we can rearrange it to say that time equals position over velocity. And we can take advantage of the fact that as this particle is going down, the next particle is just a little bit behind it. So you can, if you step back in time, you can use that same function to describe the motion of the particle ahead just a, a, a moment later. So the motion in x is the same as some other earlier x because particles oscillate. So essentially, because you're changing particles with x, but the motion is an oscillation, some earlier particle would have had the same position in the y as some particle in the past. This allows me to say you have some time t minus some t where you're at in the past. Now I want to flip what's inside of the cosine function, take advantage of the fact that the cosine equals the cosine of the negative angle. So I just flipped what's inside here. And then we can start using some of the other relationships that we learned in this particular topic or in previous topics. So we can take advantage of the fact that the velocity of the wave traveling forward, which is really what this is here, is equal to frequency times wavelength. So if we remember that angular frequency out here is 2 pi times frequency. I can pull a frequency out and I have speed here on the bottom. So frequency divided by speed is going to equal the inverse of the wavelength, which is why we end up with the wavelength down here at the bottom. And remember we have 2 pi, so that means we have to distribute the frequency to the second term as well which means that um, frequency is equal to 1 over the period, which is how we end up with the period down here in the bottom. We also have another form of the same wave function we can write. Um, so we can define something called the wave number. And the wave number is equal to 2 pi divided by the wavelength. So it's going to have units of radians per meter. So if I factor the 2 pi in, I would end up with 2 pi over the wavelength, which is the wave number. So we end up with the wave number up front here. And 2 pi divided by the period. So remember, we know that frequency is equal to 1 over the period. And we also know that the angular frequency is equal to 2 pi times the frequency. So we can get our angular frequency back there. So these are the two forms of the wave function that we'll discuss. So you really have to look at the format in here to decide what information would be provided. So the amplitude is always the max distance from equilibrium. So you have a positive amplitude or you have a negative amplitude. And so you're always going to have an x term first. 
but it, it could be divided by the wavelength or it could be multiplied by the wave number. Or, and then you're going to be subtracting off a time function. You're either going to appear in a denominator or angular frequency multiplied here. The fact that there's a minus sign in between here tells us that this wave is propagating in the positive x direction. If there was a plus sign in there, it would be propagating in the negative x direction. So what this is mostly going to be used for is to communicate information about a wave, where you would be provided the number instead of a letter A there, and a number instead of the wavelength or the wave number, and a number instead of the period or the angular frequency, and then you would use that information to determine something else about the wave. So you'll see that in the first example problem. Now, if instead of finding the position, we want to know what the speed or the acceleration of that particle in the medium. And remember, when I'm talking about the particle in the medium, I'm talking about like a piece of the rope oscillating up and down as the wave travels forward through it. So we're not talking about the speed of the wave. The speed of the wave is still equal to frequency times wavelength. This is describing the medium oscillating up and down in that simple harmonic motion. So since we have a position function, we can take the first derivative, but since this is a function of both position and time, that means we need to take a partial derivative in terms of time rather than uh, a regular derivative in terms of time. So if we take a partial derivative in terms of time of our wave function we had before, we end up with angular frequency times the amplitude times the sine of kx minus omega t. And then we can take the partial derivative in terms of time again in order to get the acceleration. So we get a negative angular frequency squared times the amplitude times the cosine of kx minus omega t. So keep in mind when we look out front, because sine and cosine oscillate between 1 and negative 1, that's essentially constraining what fraction of your max value you're going to be at a particular moment. So there's a max value goes to zero, have negative max, back to zero, back to the positive max. So whatever is in front of the trig function is your max value. All right, so the last thing I want to talk about in this video is the wave equation. A wave function that satisfies the wave equation describes the particles in a disturbance that will propagate as a wave. So you can write whatever function you want. However, for the medium to continue to oscillate up and down and propagate the wave, it actually has to satisfy the wave equation. So if we plug in our wave function here and plug our wave function here, we essentially need to get that 1 equals 1. So the left side of the equation needs to equal the right side of the equation. If that doesn't occur, then our wave function does not actually describe a wave that propagates.